Welcome to our bonus depreciation update and cost segregation tax planning webinar. Today's speaker will be the director from our New York office, Sumit Sharma. We'd like to begin all of our webinars with a little background on our company. KBKG is headquartered in Pasadena, California with additional offices in Illinois, Georgia, New York, and Texas. Since 1999, we have successfully conducted thousands of studies nationwide. KBKG's team has performed studies on facilities ranging in size from 10,000 to over 1 million square feet, resulting in the deferral of hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. We have highly qualified engineering and tax professionals on staff. Our engineering department has extensive construction experience in reading plans and utilizing RS means and Marshall and Swift cost estimation techniques. Our tax department provides support for all cost segregation tax related issues, including 1031 exchanges, AMT, passive activity, abandonment write offs, and lease provisions. We are a preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. Now I will introduce our speaker, Sumit Sharma. Sumit is a director at KBKG for the cost segregation practice. Based in New York, he has over 10 years of experience conducting fixed asset depreciation reviews, purchase price allocations, cost segregation studies, section 179D energy efficient analysis, repairs and maintenance cost analysis, and pre-construction tax consulting services. Prior to joining KBKG, Sumit worked for six years as a tax manager with PricewaterhouseCoopers in their tax projects delivery group. His experience also includes five years at a boutique consulting firm where he was engaged in various fixed asset tax consulting projects. His technical knowledge spans across various tax projects, and his experience includes a diverse mix of clients in various industries. I will now turn the presentation over to Sumit. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we'd like to begin all of our presentations with a brief overview of our learning objectives today. Um, it is going to be one hour, and I'm, I am going to try to keep it right at the one hour mark. I know there's a lot of folks on the line today who are either CPAs or tax preparers, so I respect the fact that this is a very busy time of year. Um, the learning objectives, so uh, we're going to be presenting a lot of details about bonus depreciation uh, and come at bonus depreciation from several different angles. Uh, the first half of this presentation is really going to focus on the current state of bonus depreciations under the latest tax law and the changes under the tax law. The second half is really going to dig into the old law, prior regulation, and explain why that's important and some of the differences between prior law and current law. So beginning after September 27th, 2017, the 100% bonus depreciation rate is now applicable through the end of 2022, uh, where after it is scheduled to reduce by 20% each year after that. The bonus rates can be extended an additional year for long production period property and non-commercial aircraft, but to qualify as long production period property, an asset must have a recovery period of at least 10 years. Uh, be subject to Section 263A of the Internal Revenue Code and have an estimated production period exceeding that of one year uh, and a production cost exceeding a million dollars. Um, it must have been acquired subject to a written contract entered into prior of January 1st, 2028. Uh, the new law no longer requires that the original use of the qualified property begin with the taxpayer. This is actually a really big change, so I'll repeat it again. The new law no longer requires that the original use of the qualified property begin with the taxpayer. As long as the taxpayer had not previously used the acquired property and the property was not acquired from a related party, uh, the opportunity to take bonus depreciation on acquired property is therefore a very significant benefit, uh, especially for taxpayers that have never been able to take advantage of that before. The proposed regulation section uh, 168K-2 was issued in August of 2018, and it applies to property acquired and placed in service after September 27, 2017. Uh, the proposed regs are uh, still in a common period. Taxpayers can rely on those regs though, um, but they're not required to. Uh, to be eligible for bonus depreciation property, property must uh, be of a specified type the original use of it must commence with the taxpayer, or if it's used property, once again, it must meet certain acquisition requirements. 
Um, it must be placed in service by the taxpayer within a specified time period and must be acquired by the taxpayer after September 27, 2017. For property acquired and placed in service, and this is really important, um, especially for those um, folks that are filing returns for 2018, for property that's acquired and placed in service prior to September 28, 2017, Section 168K1 generally remains applicable. So 168K-1 being the old regulations, old law. The Tax Cut and Job Act expanded qualified property eligible for bonus to include not only new property, but also used property, as I've mentioned. The new property means that the original use of the property began with the taxpayer. Um, in order for used property to be eligible for bonus depreciation, it cannot have been used by the taxpayer prior to the acquisition. Also, it must not have been acquired from a related party, uh, a component member of a controlled group or in certain carryover basis transactions. The special rules, special rules for fractional interests are distinguished between two separate scenarios. Um, if a taxpayer owned a depreciable interest in a, in a portion of a property and then subsequently acquires an additional depreciable interest in the same property, that additional interest is not treated as having been previously used by the taxpayer. So, for example, a taxpayer could have a depreciable interest in their leased space in the form of some leasehold improvements and then acquire the entire building and still meet the definition for bonus eligibility on the part of the building which they did not already own. Um, if a taxpayer owned a depreciable interest in a portion of a property, sells all or part of that portion, and then subsequently acquires a different portion of the same property, uh, the taxpayer will be treated as having owned previously the used property up to the amount of the portion in which it held a depreciable interest prior to the sale. So for example, a taxpayer sold their 25% interest in a building and then later acquired a 35% interest in the same building, they would really only have a 10% interest in, uh, in which uh, bonus eligibility uh, would be applied. The series of related transactions rules states that property is treated as if directly transferred from the original transfer to the ultimate transferee and the relationship between the original transfer and the ultimate transfer is tested immediately after the last transaction in the series. In Section 754 step-up elections, as long as there is a new partner coming in and the property has not been used by the taxpayer before, the step-up can receive new bonus depreciation. Uh, however, step-up uh, due to a death is specifically excluded from the new bonus depreciation uh, where property is received from uh, a, de a decedent and a benefactor receives a property from a decedent. I mentioned earlier that bonus eligible property must be of a specified type. Uh, this includes maker's property with a recovery period of 20 years or less, certain computer software, water utility property. It also includes a couple of new categories um, and that were introduced as part of the new law, qualified film or television production property and qualified live theatrical production property. Sadly, several types of 15-year recovery periods, these special asset classifications, were removed post-December 31st, 2017. Um, so this includes qualified leasehold imp uh, improvement property, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail property. And there's more to come about those asset classifications, as I mentioned when we talk, when we talk in the second half of the pre uh, webinar with regards to the old bonus rules. So qualified improvement property. Qualified improvement property still exists under the current tax law. It is defined as an improvement that is made to the interior of a building after the original building was placed in service. It cannot be elevator or escalator or expansion or any you know, um, non-structural items in, in, in nature. Um, and even though qualified improvement property still exists, it no longer has that favorable bonus treatment that it had under prior tax law. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act, or TCGA, removed it from the list of property of a specified type and then failed to add language clarifying the intended recovery period of 15 years, as I was mentioning during the polling question. Therefore, qualified improvement property remains as 39-year property and is no longer bonus eligible after December 31st, 2017. Um, the proposed regs do confirm that qualified improvement property acquired after that September 27th, 2017 date, and then placed in service 
before January 1st, 2018. So in that small window, that transition window at the end of 2017, if qualified improvement property was acquired and placed in service in that time period, it is eligible for 100% bonus, even though it's recovered over 39 years. There are certain types of property that are specifically excluded from bonus applicability. So in situations where the taxpayer is required to use alternative depreciation system, bonus is not applicable. Uh, examples of this include property that's used outside the United States or tax exempt use property and tax exempt bond finance property. Uh, it also uh, also excluded our property that's used primarily in certain public trades or businesses and property used in a trade or business that has floor plan financing. Think of your dealerships and farm vehicle vendors and things of that nature. So these exclusions only apply to the property acquired after September 27, 2017 and placed in service in tax years on or, or after 1118. In order to be bonus eligible, the property generally needs to be placed in service after September 27, 2017 and before January 1, 2023, where, um, where it's uh, set to phase out. When determining the placed in service date, the new regulations are generally the same as the formal rules outlined in Section 168K 1B5. With buildings uh, that are constructed new, we normally look to the date of certified occupancy. For acquired buildings, we look usually to the ready and available use standard. Um, it is possible to acquire a building that is not ready and available to use. Uh, perhaps the interior is unfinished, or there may be plans to gut and then renovate the interior in order to attract tenants. So once a building is ready and available for its use, you can begin recovering the cost of it through depreciation deductions. Qualified film and television production uh, is treated as placed in service at the time of the initial release or broadcast as defined under 181-1. Um, and a qualified live theatrical production is treated as placed in service at the time of the initial live staged performance. Based on the proposed regs, the acquisition requirements of the effective date are addressed under Section um, 13201H of the Act. The result is that there are three basic types of projects. And this is quite important because this is where actually there have been some changes from old law to new law. The three basic types are acquired existing property, new property constructed by a third party, and new property self-constructed by the taxpayer for its own use. So for existing acquired property, the date the taxpayer enters into a written binding contract is key for determining the applicable bonus rate. I'm gonna repeat that again. For existing acquired properties, the date the taxpayer enters into a written binding contract is key for determining the applicable bonus rate. The regulations clarify that a letter of intent is not a binding contract for tax purposes, a written binding contract is a contract that is enforceable under state law where liquidated, liquidated damages and provisions uh, can be 5% or more of the contract price. Um, real estate contracts that only limit damage to earnest money, which is typically less than 5% of the contract price, uh, may not meet this definition. Um, and we you recommend that taxpayers consult with a, an attorney or a tax attorney uh, regarding the binding nature of contracts in these types of situations. So for the other two types, for new construction, a new construction property uh, that is manufactured, constructed, or produced for the taxpayer by a third party under a written binding contract, the property is treated as if it were acquired pursuant to a written binding contract, just like the acquired property. Um, this is the, this is it's a pretty significant change from prior regulation, and uh, will be discussed again later on in our presentation, especially when we're going some the differences between this new law and the old law. For self-constructed property that is constructed by the taxpayer for its own use, the property is considered acquired uh, when the, and the taxpayer begins construction, begins manufacturing or producing the property. There is an optional safe harbor that allows taxpayers to determine the effective acquisition date as the date when 10% or more of the total construction costs have been incurred, or in other words, work of a significant nature has begun. So there's been a lot of discussion in our industry about the impact of 1031 uh, and the impact of the laws on 1031 exchanges. Uh, based on our understanding of the TCGA and proposed regulations, cost segregation can still be beneficial on both sides of a real estate exchange. 
KBKG believes that there is no material changes regarding the interaction between cost segregation and 1031 exchanges for several reasons. Um, the committee report suggested that there is no intent to change the nature of 1031 transactions for real estate. Personal property from cost segregation is more often than not considered real property under state law, and the matching of 1245 property is still required to avoid recapture. So with respect to bonus depreciation, you know, the bonus would only apply to the excess basis in the replacement property and not the carryover basis. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act also created a new limitation on business interest expense, which applies to all businesses, regardless of the form, on the deductibility of net business interest expense that exceeds 30% of a taxpayer's adjusted taxable income. The good news is that the Act provides an exemption from the limitation on the interest deductibility for taxpayers um, who average annual gross receipts did not exceed $25 million um, for the first, uh, I'm sorry, exceed $25 million for the, uh, for the preceding three taxable years. Taxpayers that are considered to be in a real property, trade, or business therefore have this opportunity to elect out of the limitation on interest expense deductions. However, that electing taxpayer is then required to use alternative depreciation system methodology for their depreciable property, for their real pr the property. That ADS recovery period is 40 years for commercial buildings as opposed to 39 years under the GDS rates, and it's 30 years uh, ADS for residential rental property as opposed to 27 and a half years under the GDS. Um, so uh, currently under the law, qualified improvement property is still 39 years, so that would also be a 40-year ADS life. If a technical correction does happen in the future, um, QIP or qualified improvement property may become a 15-year property, and therefore then the ADS recovery period would also would be a 20-year um, recovery period. And as a result of the mandatory use of ADS, uh, bonus is not available then on that property for that taxpayer. However, that ADS requirement, as I mentioned before, really only applies to the taxpayer's real property. The taxpayer's personal property can continue to be depreciated using GDS recovery lives and are still bonus eligible. So let's talk through some examples of how tax reform has really affected bonus depreciation. We're gonna run through four scenarios here. So scenario one, suppose a taxpayer enters an agreement to purchase equipment on August of 2017 with a 25% penalty for restocking if the contract is canceled. If the equipment is delivered and installed on October 1st, 2017, it would be eligible for 50% bonus. Even though it's placed in service after September 27th, the taxpayer had a binding contract in place prior to that date and therefore is subject to the old law, old bonus 50%. Now suppose a taxpayer begins construction on new interior improvements they use a general contractor, so a third party, on October 1st, 2017, with the work being completed and placed in service January of 2018. So in this case, the property is eligible for 100% bonus because both the placed in service and deemed acquisition date are after that September 27th, that, um, after that September 27th date. So now let's consider a taxpayer who signs a letter of intent to acquire a freestanding restaurant in uh, June of 2017, but the acquisition doesn't actually occur until November of 2017, after which the taxpayer promptly opens for business. So in this case, the placed in service date and acquisition date are post September 27, uh, September 27, 2017, because a letter of intent is not a binding contract. So that's the trick in that situation. And so this would be qualified for 100%. And at that time period in 2017, qualified restaurant property still existed. So even the structure would qualify for a 15-year recovery period and 100% bonus. Last, we have a taxpayer that begins construction on its own property, the self-constructed property, September 1st, 2017. As of October of 2017, only 8% of the total construction costs had been incurred. Ultimately, it's completed and placed in service in May of 2018. So it didn't meet that self-constructed property test, less than 10% of the property was uh, the construction that had been incurred prior to September 27th. So it is therefore considered acquired after the 27th. And in this case, then bonus eligible um, and placed in service and, uh, and acquired after September 27th. So therefore 100% bonus eligible. 
Section 179 allows businesses to deduct the cost of purchasing qualified equipment and software. So for 2018, the deduction limit has been increased to a million dollars. The 2018 spending cap is set at two and a half million, which means there's a dollar for dollar reduction in the million dollar deduction limit for every dollar spent in excess of the $2.5 million cap. The TCGA permits 179 expensing now for roofs, HVAC work, fire alarm work, fire protection work, and security systems. Uh, this is only applicable to commercial buildings, not residential, and it is limited to improvements made after the building was first placed in service. So generally, the rules in uh, Section 179 D5 also prevent certain non-corporate real estate investors from taking advantage of this uh, 179 expensing treatment. Um, so by an example, let's suppose a client purchased a 10-year-old building in 2018 for $4 million. Before it placed it in service, they put on a new roof and they did HVAC, fire protection, and security work for $500,000. So all of that are all of those expenses, those $500,000 work expenses are eligible for 179 expensing. Um, now you may be thinking, how can this be true since the improvements were done before the taxpayer actually placed the new building in service? The key here is that the building was originally placed in service 10 years ago by some other taxpayer. So that's the trick is that, you know, as long as it's, uh, the work was done after it was first placed in service um, originally, then it, it meets the definition and it satisfies the definitions for 179 expensing. 179 expensing now includes personal property as well used for furnishing lodgings such as furniture and appliances and hotels, apartment buildings and student housing. Uh, something to consider is that there's no real benefit to taking the 179 expense on tangible personal property that's already eligible for 100% bonus depreciation. So taxpayers are recommended to, you know, kind of consider these um, these rules with regards to 179 and bonus and sort of how to um, appropriately strategize and order those. Tax reform has made major changes to the utilization of net operating losses as well. The carryover and carryback rules have changed and then a new limitation on NOL utilizations has been added. So under the prior law, NOLs were generally eligible for a two-year carryback and a 20-year carry forward. Further NOL carrybacks and uh, carryovers could fully offset the taxable income of a taxpayer if not otherwise limited under the Internal Revenue Code. So both of these rules have now changed. Current law disallows NOL carrybacks, but allows the indefinite carry forward of those NOLs. In any given tax year, however, the NOL deductions cannot exceed 80% of a taxpayer's pre-NOL deduction taxable income. These limitations on the use of NOL deductions only apply to NOLs generated after 2017, um, which obviously naturally provided a lot of motivation to many taxpayers to maximize deductions. Uh, in, for their 2017 return. So this is actually the second half of the presentation, as I mentioned. We've just covered a lot of the rules and specifically the changes to the current tax law, but we do want to spend a little bit of time understanding what were the rules prior and why does it help to understand, because it kind of helps actually some of the transition um, as we do have taxpayers and folks out there that are dealing with property and projects that were acquired or construction began in 2016 or 2017 and are only now coming online in 2018. And so that's where it's, it's sort of helpful to kind of have a refresher as to what the old tax laws were. Bonus depreciation opportunities, they span multiple tax years. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, for example, definitely impact the way bonus worked. So even so, the historical rules still apply when you retroactively look back to property placed in service in prior years. So that's important. So if you're looking, we're doing a retroactive study, if you're looking back to assets placed in service in a prior year, those old rules apply. So let's recap a little bit of those old regulations under 160AK for property placed in service prior to September 28, 2017. In order for property to qualify for bonus, a series of criteria had to have been met. The property must be of a specified type. The property must be of original use. You, you uh, perhaps remember me bringing this up uh, earlier in the slide. The property must have been acquired by the taxpayer after December 31st, 2007. Uh, and this gets actually back to certain old written binding contract issues uh, that we'll discuss later. And the property must be placed in service during the applicable bonus depreciation window periods. So for your reference, here's a listing of the specified property, which will qualify for bonus depreciation. Qualified improvement property was added with the PATH Act of 2015. 
and all QIP property was bonus depreciation eligible through the end of 2017. And this bonus criteria replaced the more narrow qualified leasehold improvement property um, definitions. Um, and so prior to 2018, QIP was bonus eligible, even though it had a 39 year recovery period, qualified leasehold improvement property still existed. That had uh, the advantage of a 15 year recovery period, qualified retail improvement and qualified restaurant property also existed in 2017 and years prior. They were also a 15 year um, property and eligible for bonus uh, in 2016 and 2017 for qualified retail and eligible for bonus in 2008 for qualified restaurants. Uh, as a recap of bonus eligibility rules, remember that any maker's property with a GDS recovery period of 20 years or less is, is generally eligible for bonus depreciation. Uh, this includes all personal property with a recovery period of less than 20 years. Certain water utility property and certain computer software was also eligible for bonus depreciation. Also long production period property. Uh, anything that was required to be depreciated using ADS was not eligible. So the, all, a lot of these things very familiar with the new law. And depending on the year, bonus depreciation has been applicable to other types of qualified property too. Um, and we'll summarize these in our qualified improvement quick reference chart. So now we'll get into the different types of qualified real property that have special benefits that either have a shorter recovery period or, uh, or bonus depreciation eligibility or both. So qualified leasehold improvement property, this is a uh, asset classification that's quite familiar to many folks out there. This is uh, especially those commercial properties where you have tenants or retail tenants or office tenants where these are interior improvements. Uh, many folks are sort of familiar. This was basically any Section 1250 property, which was an improvement to non-residential real property and also an improvement to the interior portion of a building occupied exclusively by a lessee. Uh, in other words, the improvement could not be for common areas or shared areas amongst several tenants in, uh, in order to receive that 15-year recovery period. Um, so Q, uh, QLI, or Qualified Leasehold, it also had to be placed in service more than three years after the building was first placed in service. An example would be constructing a leased space in a historic office building, which would meet the age requirement versus building out the same lease space in an office tower just built that year or just built in a previous year. Again, this is exclusively for qualified leasehold improvement property, 15 year recovery period, uh, not the bonus eligibility because in these two examples, both would have been el um, uh, eligible for QIP anyway. So qualified leasehold had to be property constructed pursuant to a lease between unrelated parties, uh, you can make this determination by using the criteria from code section 1504 or by applying an 80% or more test in place of the 50% test in code section 267. So essentially, if there's 80% common ownership in both entities, then you had related party interests. So even though the qualified leasehold improvement uh, bonus depreciation verbiage was replaced with qualified improvement property references in the PATH Act, just be aware that qualified leasehold improvement property still existed through the end of 2017 along with its 15-year recovery period. Um, additionally, by definition, everything that meets the, the qualified leasehold um, requirement is also meeting the qualified improvement property requirement. Um, so that's, so they were both bonus eligible. So going further with the definition of qualified leasehold improvement, um, these are um, some items that are specifically excluded from qualified leasehold improvement, any costs incurred related to the enlargement of the building doesn't meet the definition of QLI. Costs for elevators, escalators also don't meet that definition. Uh, and we already mentioned how common areas improvements don't meet the definition because they're not pursuant to a lease. And then any costs that are related to the internal structural framework of a building are also excluded from the definition of qualified uh, leasehold improvement property. Uh, many tax preparers uh, and uh, taxpayers, honestly, you know, make the mistake of claiming qualified leasehold on all of their tenant improvements that they've paid for, assuming that they're all qualified leasehold improvements. But that's not always the case. You know that you know commonly we do find that when taxpayers are uh, performing qualified leasehold improvement work, there is some sort of structural work or elevated work or things like that, maybe for the facade or for even for windows that's occurring that should that should be properly treated as real property and not qualified leasehold improvement property. So I've listed a, a number of questionable examples here. Um, and you know, these are for your reference, but these are only just some common things that we do find 
uh, roofing, as I, as I mentioned, the elevators, windows, things like that. So it's important to note that the, less, that the lease cannot be between related parties, as I was mentioning before. There's rules under code section 1504 that state that if there's 80% common ownership in both entities, the lessor and the lessee will be considered related parties. Uh, otherwise, if it's not 80% uh, common ownership, they're considered unrelated. Um, so we're gonna go through an example here of how all of this works with some help from, uh, from another Pasadena-based cast of characters. Uh, as Alan mentioned, our headquarters are based in Pasadena, California. So this is a little bit of a, a fun slide. So Penny and Leonard, our business partners, 50-50, in a research development business called Bazinga. They lease the space from a real estate holding company called TBBT LLC. So TBBT has an ownership structure consisting of 35% Penny, 35% Leonard, 20% Sheldon, and 5% Raj and Howard. So in this instance, TBBB has a 70% common ownership with Bazinga's um, Penny, Penny and Leonard's company. And since um, the unrelated party rules requires an ownership percentage of less than 80%, the office space would meet the criteria of qualified leasehold improvement. It would receive 15 year recovery period. Um, and then additionally, if, if the scope of work completed meets the definition of qualified improvement property, then bonus depreciation is applicable too. So what exactly is qualified improvement property? Well, as you see, the qualified improvement property definition is very similar to the qualified leasehold definition, with just a few exceptions. The improvement does not have to be completed pursuant to a lease, um, and therefore can be for common areas and common spaces and shared spaces. The improvement can be to common areas. The improvement does not have to be at least three years old. So this is tricky. Uh, theoretically, someone could place a building shell in service in January of 2017, and then separately place the build out in service in July and receive 50% bonus depreciation rather than placing the entire building with the interior fit out, uh, fit out in service um, at the same time um, where they wouldn't then receive the bonus depreciation. Um, so that's where something, you know, has to be sort of, so that's, that's where when, it, you know, there's major differences when compared to the qualified leasehold improvement definitions. So the less restrictive definition of qualified improvement property essentially expands the opportunity for bonus depreciation to include taxpayers who improve owner-occupied buildings or landlords that are making improvements to common areas and leased buildings. Also, qualified improvement property prior to 2018 is recovered over 39 years, but is bonus eligible? Going forward, as I've mentioned before, earlier in the presentation, after 2017, qualified improvement property is still recovered over 39 years. However, it is not bonus eligible. Uh, the House and Senate both intended to make it, you know, qualified improvement property with a 15-year recovery period. Uh, however, under the TCGA language, it you know didn't specify it as such, um, and so we are still waiting on on bated breath here. So until there's a technical correction come out, um, we you know, assume that the recovery period is still uh, technical or the, the technical law is that qualified improvement property is 39 years and not bonus eligible. Similar to qualified leasehold, qualified restaurant property was permanently extended by the PATH Act. Uh, however, the TCGA eliminated this category effective January 1st, 2018. Um, so a couple of very interesting things about qualified restaurant property is that it can be acquired property. Um, notice the word improvement is no longer in the description, uh, and it can apply to Section 1250 structural real property components as well. So in other words, the building. In order for a property to meet the requirements of qualified restaurant property, at least 50% of the building square footage must be devoted to the preparation and seating and or seating uh, for, uh, for on-premise consumption of prepared meals. So remember, an improvement to a qualified restaurant can meet the definition of qualified improvement property as well and receive bonus depreciation on top of that 15-year uh, recovery period. So also, as I mentioned earlier, qualified restaurant property acquired between that transition window date of September, 27, September 28th, rather, and, and uh, December 31st, is eligible for both the 15-year recovery period and 100% bonus treatment uh, on the entire structure, not just the improvement. Retail property is very similar to QLI, uh, but can be owner-occupied. The improvement must be non-residential real property in a portion of the building that is open to the general public and used in the retail trade or business of selling tangible personal property to the general public. 
from 2009 through 15, qualified retail improvement property um, was not eligible for bonus unless it also met the criteria for qualified leasehold. Um, from 2016 through 2017, qualified retail was also eligible for bonus depreciation without needing to meet that qualified leasehold criteria. So now that we've covered the general rules related to bonus depreciation, let's go beneath the surface and examine uh, some of the details behind several of the requirements. Uh, as with most aspects of the tax code, there can be various issues that pop up as we look at implementing these benefits. Uh, the next portion of our presentation is gonna go into detail related to the KBKG qualified improvement chart, um, and then self-constructed property acquisition rules written by any contracts. And then finally, you know, we're gonna be talking about some planning considerations and strategies to think about for tax purposes. So this is just a snipped image. Hopefully you guys can see it clearly, but if you cannot see it, there is a link at the bottom um, of our presentation here. And we do encourage you to go check out this link. This is a snipped image of what we call our qualified improvement reference chart. Um, it's available on our website. Many CPAs and many of our clients love this chart. They uh, print it out, they keep it handy, they post it on their, on their wall. Um, some even actually pass it out to some of their staff. Uh, especially this, at this time of year, the staff are sort of, you know, heads down, buried in work. Um, I even have it, you know, handed out to some colleagues. So, it's a, you know, I do encourage you to take a look at this. It does summarize a lot of the things that we've talked about with regards to qualified leasehold, qualified improvement, qualified restaurant, qualified retail, um, the bonus applicability rules, the three-year rules, uh, when is it applicable, the dates, uh, of when bonus rates kind of change 30%, 50%, 100%, uh, and so forth. So highly recommend it. It is a two-page reference chart, um, so please check that out. So the next topic I wanted to talk about is self-constructed property. Um, so if you or your client are a landlord, a retailer, or a professional services firm, or anyone that leases a property, so this could really apply for you. Historically, self-constructed property has been any property that is constructed by the taxpayer themselves or is property constructed for the taxpayer by another person under a written binding contract, as long as that contract was entered into prior to the start of construction. So as long as you had signed the contract before construction began, the project was considered self-constructed and not subject to the written binding contract rules that you'll find in the bonus rates for determining bonus depreciation rates and eligibility now. When construction of the self-constructed property began is, when, is what's going to really dictate your bonus depreciation rate and your bonus depreciation eligibility. Um, so as discussed at the beginning of the webinar regarding the current law and the latest proposed regs, if property is constructed for the taxpayer by another person pursuant to written binding contract that was entered into prior to construction of the property, the self-constructed property rules don't apply, and the acquisition rule is met on the date the written binding contract is entered into. So that simplified the determination of eligibility uh, for the additional first-year depreciation deductions. It also reduced the number of properties that would otherwise be eligible for the more favorable 100% depreciation, during those especially during those final months of 2017 transition period. So acquired versus self-constructed. This is a very important thing to understand the difference here. According to the old bonus regulations under 168K-1, an example of acquired property would include a situation where a developer started construction of a spec property, a taxpayer then could sign a contract to acquire it after construction has already commenced, but not yet completed, and this property would be eligible for bonus, subject to the written binding contract rules. The date when the contract to acquire is executed is critical to the applicability of the bonus depreciation. With self-constructed property, the taxpayer signs a contract to acquire the property before construction commences. The date of the contract is not relevant to the bonus eligibility, except as noted in the proposed regs. There does not need, or sorry, sorry, there does need to be consideration of when construction work of a significant nature is completed with the old bonus regs. There's that 10% safe harbor, as I've mentioned before. So here's an example of an acquired property. The developer begins construction of a building on August of 2017 and expects to complete the project sometime in 2018. The taxpayer signs a written contract after the construction began on August 28th of 2017, and the property then is actually 
you know, placement service in 2018. If a cost segment study was done, all of those short recovery period uh, property items would be eligible for the 40% bonus depreciation rate, not the 100% depreciation rate, because the binding contract was signed before September 27, 2018. Um, so this is considered acquired property because the ownership happened in 2017. Uh, so the old bonus rules apply. And under those old rules, the old bonus regulations had a phase down from 50% to 40% in 2018, and then 30% in 2019. And so therefore, if this project had been placed in service in December of 2017, yeah, they would have got the 50, but rather since it's getting placed in service in 2018, it gets the 40% rate. So quite a unique situation here, you know, property uh, acquired, prior to 20, uh, September 28, 2017, getting placed in service in 2018, you would think 100%, but no, it really actually only gets 40%. So let's go back over the written binding contract rules. So these rules are applicable to acquired property. You can look at the regs for detailed guidance on the definition of a binding contract, but in general, a contract is binding only if, there's, if it's enforceable under state law against the taxpayer and does not limit damages to a specified amount. Um, it, considered binding even if subject to a condition. Uh, a contract will continue to be binding even if parties make substantial changes in the terms and conditions. So for planning considerations, if a taxpayer signs a written binding contract after construction begins, you should look to see if any substantial changes were made to the contract during a bonus eligible period. Now let's look at this, uh, this example for self-constructed property. In my example, I will be applying the old rules once again, since uh, the new rules um, were written redefining self-constructed property uh, in 2018. The so last time we had 100% bonus was uh, in 2010-2011. The bonus rate dropped from 50% um, uh, back down to 50% in January 1st, 2012, through December 27, 2017. So assuming a taxpayer had a written binding contract executed on March of 2011, construction commenced in September of 2012, and the project was then completed and placed in service July of 2013. This is considered self-constructed property, meaning the contract to acquire was executed before the construction began. We look to when work of a significant nature has occurred or work of significant nature has been completed. And, um, in this situation, if we assume that work of a significant nature had not been completed by that January 1st, 2012, then all of the bonus eligible costs would meet the 50% criteria instead of the 100%. In a retroactive study, um, you know, this has an impact. I mean, the five-year property placed in service in 2013 should almost be fully depreciated by now, um, um, even, even without bonus depreciation. But for 15-year property, like for example, land improvements, you know, bonus could make a difference in the first year impact of the retroactive study. When dealing with self-constructed property, you have to consider when construction begins. Uh, this is dis defined within the regulations as work of a significant nature. What is work of a significant nature? Well, the safe harbor rule that helps with this factual determination is physical work of a significant nature occurs after the taxpayer pays or incurs more than 10% of the total cost of the property excluding land, excluding preliminary activities, such as planning or designing, architectural, clearing, securing, financing, things like that. So the real, the, the true hard construction cost. So for accrual-based taxpayers, even if they didn't yet pay 10% of the cost, but 10% of the construction is completed, construction has begun, um, documentation of this is critical and is typically done as part of a cost segregation study. So last few minutes here, um, so speaking of cost segregation, uh, remember the goal of a cost segregation is to reclassify a substantial portion of those building components um, into shorter tax recovery periods, um, period, periods like five year, seven year, 15 years, as opposed to the long life production period like 39 year commercial or 27 and a half year residential. So by doing this, you're making those identified costs and perhaps some, some of those identified costs bonus eligible. You're taking full advantage of the bonus rules. You're identifying all of those components that perhaps could be eligible. Um, so construction activities that include process piping and fixtures within a building that are accessory to the business activity are also bonus eligible and could be carved out as short recovery period personal property. Um, certain finished carpentry, millwork, cabinetry, things of those natures, special electrical connections or wiring or data connections. 
business activity equipment, uh, and then even certain exterior land improvements. These are all things that could be bonus eligible. Historically, cost segregations really just focused on identifying, like I mentioned, five, seven, 15 year property, but primarily due to the tangible property regulations and this concept of unit of property, uh, current cost segregations should be leveraged to provide a lot more detail than ever. Uh, as illustrated on the slide, you can see uh, even the 39 year property needs to be segregated between the various building components. The potential for deducting current year repair activity or retirement loss deductions or removal costs, you know, need to be considered, especially when you're doing uh, cost irrigation studies today. You know, those those benefits can be reaped several years down the road when you are incurring improvements or repair projects. Uh, additionally, you know, green building deductions and credits should be considered uh, special property classifications, like I mentioned before, in eligible years, like qualified leasehold, retail, qualified restaurant, should also be addressed. Uh, a cost irrigation study really is just, it's a natural launching point for exploring all of these related opportunities because we already have, you know, we're already working with many of the relevant data facts and we have an understanding of the, the facts and circumstances surrounding the property and, and, and these opportunities. Cost irrigation is probably one of the most common tax planning tools available that benefits real estate owners. Uh, the studies are commonly performed in the year the building is acquired or constructed. However, as I mentioned before, it can be done any time after the building is placed in service. If the taxpayer is currently uh, consuming prior NOLs and the projects have a, you know, taxable income in future years, they may prefer to wait until they do the study. Uh, by filing a Form 315 for a change in accounting method in that future year, the taxpayer can then catch up all of those missed deductions, as I mentioned. So it's a little bit of a strategy there, timing strategy as to when to apply. Uh, traditionally, cost segs have not made economic sense if there was a depreciable basis less than 750000 I think that's a, a safe rule of thumb to apply when you're looking back to see how much basis is left. You know, properties, I would say property between, you know, more more than 500 to 750 is definitely something worth looking at whether cost that can apply. Um, we've actually recently developed a new software tool on our website specifically designed for residential properties only that allows tax preparers to generate cost seg studies for a very, very modest fee on properties with a basis that is that is even less than five hundred thousand um, dollars. Actually, after today's presentation, um, we are going to provide a little bit more information uh, specifically about that software tool. So please stay tuned. Please note that everything that we've discussed today, and this is important, so everything that we've discussed today is for federal tax purposes only. So to understand how federal tax reform would change state tax codes and revenues, um, we need to explore the idea of conformity. For reasons of administrative simplicity, states frequently seek to conform many, um, though you know rarely all, elements of their tax codes to the federal tax code. So this harmonization of the definitions and policies reduces compliance costs for individuals and businesses with liability in, in multiple states and limits the potential for double taxation of income. Um, no state conforms to the federal code in, in all respects, and not all provisions of the federal code make for good tax policy, but you know, greater conformity substantially reduces that tax complexity, and you know, it has a significant value. Uh, the federal tax impacts of cost irrigation studies are typically significant enough to justify these studies. Any additional state tax benefits that may be applicable to serve only to enhance the value of the studies even more. Um, so if there are any unique state incentives that require building components to be broken out in a certain way, you know, consider ask, you know, asking your cost segregation professional or provider to include that in their scope of work. So as I bring this webinar to a conclusion, just the last few minutes left, uh, I think it's important to mention that there are you know, significant differences amongst a lot of cost segregation providers and advisors in the marketplace. Sometimes tax preparers aren't immediately aware of how those differences can impact their uh, experience. Um, so I've mentioned, you know, the importance of using, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, I would say a recommended provider or a certified provider. KBKG is a member of the ASCSP. Uh, many of our professionals at KBKG are ASCSP certified. Um, so please, you know, ask to see resumes, ask to look at bios. You know, what, you know, look into the experience of the of the individuals that you're working with. Uh, some taxpayers need to consider, you know, the bench of strength of, of a provider, you know, before they, you know, before they engage. And we highly recommend that you visit our website, look at our professional qualifications, and uh, and consider KBKG for your cost recovery needs.